advantages of high wages, opportunities for employment, tempting prospects of ad advancement, but these are largely counterbalanced by high rents and prices. Its social opportunities and its place of amusement are very alluring, but excessive hours of toil, distance from work, and the isolation of crowds tend to great tend greatly to reduce the value of these good things. The well-lit streets are a great attraction, especially in winter, but the sunlight is more is being more or more shut out, while the air is vitiated that that the fine public buildings like the sparrows rapidly become covered with soot and the very statues are in despair. The palatial edifices and fearful slums are the, are the strange complementary features of modern cities. The country magnet declares herself to be the source of all beauty and wealth, but the town magnet mockingly reminds her that she is full of she is very dull for lack of society and very sparing of her gift for the lack of capital. There, there are in countries beautiful vistas, tawdry parks, violet scented woods, fresh air, sounds of rippling water. But too often, one sees those threatening words trespassers will be prosecuted. Rents, if estimated by the acre, are certainly low. But such low rents are the natural fruit of low wages rather than a cause of substantial comfort. While long hours and lack of amusement forbid the bright sunshine and the pure air to gladden the hearts of the people. The one industry, agriculture, suffers frequently from excessive rainfalls. But this wondrous harvest of the clouds is seldom properly in gathered, so that in times of drought there is frequently even there is frequently even for drinking purposes most insufficient supply even the natural healthfulness of the country is largely lost lost for lack of proper drainage and other sanitary conditions while in parts almost deserted by the people the few who remain are yet frequently huddled together as if in rivalry with the slums of our city but neither the town magnet nor the country magnet represents the full plan and purpose of nature. Human society and the beauty of nature are meant to be enjoyed together. The two magnets must be made as one, as man and woman by their varied gifts and faculty, faculty supplement each other, so should town and country. The town is the symbol of society, of mutual help and friendly cooperation of fatherhood motherhood, brotherhood, sisterhood of wide relations between man and man of world, expanding sympathies of science, art, culture, religion, and the country. The country is, is the symbol of God's love and care for man, that all that we are and all that we, we have come, we have comes from it. Our bodies are formed of it, to, to it they return. We are fed by it, clothed by it, and by it we are warmed and sheltered. On its bosom we rest. Its, its beauty is the inspiration of art, of music, of poetry. It forces propel all the wheels of industry. It is the source of it, it is the source of all health, all wealth, all knowledge. But its fullness of joy and wisdom has not revealed itself to man. Nor can it ever so long, so long as it's as this unholy, unnatural separation of nature and of society and nature endures. Town and country must be married, and out of this joyous union will spring a new hope, a new life, a new civilization. It's, it is the purpose of this work to show how a, how a first step can be taken in this direction by the construction of a town country magnet. And I hope to convince the reader that this is a this is practic practicable here and now that on the principles which are the soundest whether viewed from the ethical or economic standpoint i will undertake then to show how in town country equal nay be better opportunities of social intercourse may be enjoyed than are enjoyed in any crowded city while yet the beauties of na of nature may encompass and enfold each dwellers each dweller therein. How higher wages are compatible with reduced rents and rates, 
have abundant opportunities for employment and bright prospect of adv advancement may be secured for all. How capital may be attracted and wealth and wealth created. How the most admirable sanitary conditions may be ensured. How beautiful homes and gardens may be seen on every on every hand. How the bounds of freedom may be widened and yet all the best of the concert and cooperation gathered in by a happy people. The construction of such a magnet could it be could it be affected followed as it would be by the construction of many more would certainly afford a solution of burning question set before us by Sir John Gorst. How to back the tide of migration of the people into the into the towns and to get them back upon the land. Yeah. OK, just keep this diagram on on the screen. All right. Uh, now, first, before we do anything, um, start discussion. Why are there only 57 people in class today? Yeah, do you have any idea? I think because of the submission we had today, might be. What submission we had? Uh, like yesterday we had our ID submission and today we had our landscape submission. So that is over, right? You submit it. Yeah. 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 Oh, so people are recovering. Might be. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Just catching up on sleep and all that. Okay. Fine. So that is uh, that is all right. So just for the just for my knowledge. All right. So um. These three magnets. Now, how many of you have heard about Ebenezer Howard before or have seen some of these diagrams? There's one, this is one. There's another one which is very famous, uh, which is these concentric circles. Uh, you must have seen those uh, diagrams as well of the Garden City. Uh, yeah. Anybody seen this before? I think we saw few in uh, in our architectural theory course where they were talking about utopian cities. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So what did you uh, what do you what do you remember from that discussion? Uh, I think it was uh, it was a city uh, with with uh, economic background of salt pans. So like how there were like. Uh, uh, salt pans and how there were salt pans in the middle and then there was there was like uh, streets then then housing and then there then salt there pan. was like garden salt pan. Thing. what what uh, are, are you saying salt pan i think salt pan i'm not clear but it it it, it was salt pan um okay then what else you remember just just tell us whatever you remember yeah so yeah, how how the how uh, it was it was it had the same idea that how how the industry and as well as the uh, living both can be achieved yeah, both can be achieved uh, in 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 a parallel way so that the, the comfort is also seen so yeah it was it was like that key the the salt the the economy also gets in and the standards of living are also maintained it was like in a some in a circular plan it was there yeah 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 no whatever you said is fine it's correct except for the salt pan bit which is uh, i don't know where that has come from um, okay. because uh, yeah. i i mean in in, the, in all of ebenezer howard's work i have not come across salt pans so um but that's 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 fine that's fine maybe it got mixed up uh, in what you were saying yeah, it um yeah uh, anybody else wants to uh, discuss what you had uh, spoken about um, these uh, diagrams or Howard's ideas. Whatever you recollect, it's, uh, it's absolutely fine. Nobody? Come on, you guys have like uh, memories of, uh, I don't know, some aquatic animals, like literally three minutes or three seconds or whatever. 
Hmm? All right, fine. Um, so just zoom into this diagram a little. Sir, what? Okay. So. So yeah, as I said in the introduction. Um, there was uh, this was a time when Ebenezer Howard's writing, writing. This is the end of the uh, 1800s, early 1900s, right? This is when he wrote the two or three books that he published at that time. Um, and uh, this is literally a kind of a reaction to the industrial city and the kind of uh, uh, responses to that, you know, uh, by the Romantics and by others. Um, there was a whole movement called Back to Land which was about going back uh, to the countryside. Uh, the city was perceived as a force of evil, uh, you know, uh, destructive, uh, uh, exploitative. Um, I mean, obviously the entire imagery of the city was that. Uh, so Howard here um, is kind of uh, trying to make an argument. So he talks about three magnets. Now the, the, the use of the word magnet is instructive because he says there are certain things that attract you to the town, there are certain things that attract you to the countryside, okay? Uh, but if you produce a town country, in his words, uh, it will also be a magnet. Hmm? And that magnet is different from the town magnet and the country magnet. Now, the reason, again, the use of the word magnet is important because a lot of people migrated to cities in search of certain things. Hmm? At the same time, a lot of people fled from the city to the countryside in search of certain things. But so what he says is that if you create a city which is a combination of this, the town and the country, uh, everybody will have uh, some reason to um, to live here. In in and it will combine all the positive values of the town and the country and so on. Right. Uh, so essentially, this idea comes from there. Hmm? Now there was the other diagram, which is those concentric circles and all that. What is important to understand here is first of all. This is not in the tradition of a utopian city, the way in which, uh, let's say, Thomas More's Utopia was written and so on. You know, the literature on utopian cities is of a specific kind. Uh, it is about, uh, you know, the, the, the writing of a utopia is a form of social commentary. You, you, I mean, we shouldn't think about utopia as just, a, you know, a nice thought uh, or something interesting to think about. Uh, um, the 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 function of a utopian imagination is a commentary or or uh, some critical um, uh, um, discussion about the world as it exists now. Okay, that is why utopias are written. Hmm? Even dystopias actually play the same function. So you will recognize that utopias and dystopias are doing the same thing. One is telling you how um, if you take a different path, uh, you can reach an ideal place. Where the other is telling you, if you continue on this path, you will reach a terrible place, right? So that is what, but both are essentially trying to shed light on current reality. And that is why they are important to look at, you know, when you study utopias, for instance. Uh, also, one must uh, kind of uh, uh, think about uh, utopian, uh, the discussion about utopian societies. Uh, less from the perspective of its built environment, but more from the perspective of its social uh, uh, reality that is being depicted. So, you know, you can go back to utopian literature all the way to Plato. And Plato's utopia, uh, especially Sparta, was, um, was a city that he envisioned which would be ideal for warfare, you know, to, to, to create the perfect military state. You know? um, and so, obviously, utopian writers have their own so Thomas More's Utopia was more a uh, commentary on social injustice, you know. Um, and now Ebenezer Howard doesn't fall in that utopian. So it's, I think, incorrect to think about Garden Cities as Utopia. Actually, Garden Cities is a, something that uh, Howard believed is very much things that you can do. You know, it wouldn't require an entire social revolution to implement. It would simply require a different way of doing things. So it was more reformist than uh, completely imaginary. Hmm? Uh, it was not even re revolutionary. It was simply reformist. You know, just change the way you do things and 
you know, change this, 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 and you will get there. Rather than thinking about, okay, you know, you have to pull down the whole system and um, uh, and to invent a new way of doing things. No, nothing like that. Hmm? In fact, um, Garden City ideas were implemented in many parts of the world. Um, full, complete towns were built on the on Garden City lines, and in within cities there were interventions which were Garden City interventions. Bombay has it, you know, the other Parsi colony, Hindu colony. Those are all designed on Garden City lines. Obviously, it's not the way in which Howard imagined them, but still, the, there are certain uh, elements of uh, the Garden City ideal in 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 those uh, town plans, as you would call them. Hmm? So, it's not entirely utopian as such. Hmm? So, that's important to bear in mind. Um, you also uh, 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 recognize, if you look at these three and you read the text in each of them, um, there is a certain kind of... Uh, uh, a recognition that a town is a place where there is employment uh, opportunity, where there is a place where people come for uh, money and wages and work. You know, um, there is a place where, but it is also a place which produces uh, foul air and, you know, drainage problem, costly drainage problems and slums and all of that, right? So there are those things about the town. Whereas in the country, what you don't have, you have all of the things you live close to nature and, you know, you have uh, peaceful surroundings and you have, but you don't have a society. You may have a community, but you don't have a society. You don't have the um, vibrant uh, life of a city, you know. Uh, you don't have uh, the, um, the kind of uh, um, uh, possibilities of uh, social exchange that you have in the city and so on, right? So he's recognizing these pros and cons, let's say, of the town and country. And then he's suggesting, so what if you bring them together? So you have duty uh, of nature, but you also have social opportunity, right? That's the first line in the town and country magnet. And if you see the last two in, in that list, you see freedom and cooperation. Now, this is a very important, and this is rather under-emphasized when people talk about Ebenezer Howard. There are two or three things that people don't talk about when they talk about Ebenezer Howard, which is a very serious mistake because those are the found fundamental elements in Howard. One is that uh, even those concentric circle diagrams that he talks about when he talks about Garden City, he's not talking about a master plan. Those circles are not a master plan. They're a model, you know, uh, um, an abstract model. So when you actually design or plan a Garden City, it will. It need not be concentric circles, you know. Uh, so you can't really think of that as the master plan for a city. It is more of a conceptual model for the city. You know, it's a, like architects like to call those things diagrams. You know, so it's, it's a diagram, hmm? but it's not the plan. It's not a plan. Okay. So that's important to bear in mind because that always leads to this misunderstanding that oh, he was a utopian and all that. Okay. Uh, the second thing. Remember that he was a planner, you know, uh, Ebenezer Howard. He was not a social thinker or a philosopher or anything like that. He was a practicing planner, literally. Hmm? Um, the other thing is, uh, that's important, which is always uh, missed out when one discusses Ebenezer Howard, is the entire economic logic of this garden. So Howard was a believer that a large part of the result of um, the, the problems in urban life are due to not because of aesthetic reasons, you know, like um, poor quality housing or uh, um, badly organized cities or things like that. But for, for him, what was central was the economic exploitation, which was at the root of those conditions. Hmm? So his idea actually was that you the, the city would actually be based on a cooperative model hmm? where each person in the city has a share in the total land of the city. Okay, so you essentially buy land shares. Everybody has a share in land. Okay, so what happens then is that you, maybe you'll, you'll need to borrow uh, money from somebody to buy that land, but you can do that. Okay, now all of the city's dwellers are landowners, but not a particular parcel of land. They all own the entire land collectively. Okay. And then as rents rise in the city, you know, because things happen and obviously uh, land prices will increase and so on, the rents from that land go to the, becomes the source of revenue for the city. And then you can pay back the debt 
and then all of the revenue that is generated in terms of land rent are collectively owned by the city and then those rents can be used you know it's like a larger uh, community land reserve land trust kind of model so it's not individual private ownership of land but it is collective ownership of all land in the city somebody raise their hand go ahead yeah it's one thing if everyone owns land then who's who's paying the rent because they all own land no so there's a the the idea is that everybody owns a share of the land but not a particular part okay so now what happens is let's say you start a factory hmm? if you start a factory the factory will um have a function so uh, in the, the way land economics works is that you always paying rent for location you know so for the same parcel of land in kolaba is going to cost very different the same size of parcel in land in kolaba is going to cost very different as compared to dhaisar okay the land is the same the materials are the same the stuff is the same but the how does the land value change so much it is because of the location and the location the the uh, the reason why people are willing to pay so much for the location is because there are things happening there are certain kind of activities happening which are benefiting from that location okay you don't have to move around so much and things are at in close proximity and so on, right so when those functions start taking place land starts getting used its value tends to increase now instead of having individual land owners who grab the whole rent what you will have is that there is a single rent which is paid to the city okay so the city as a whole is the landlord hmm? but the city because it is uh, uh, a representative kind of a democracy uh, thing you have uh, everybody who has a share of the profit of the of the rent so it's a single rent for any use in the land okay so because there will be activities and there will be uh, certain locations which should become more valued than other locations you will have to pay a rent if you are using that land but you don't pay the rent to the private owner you pay the rent to the city you understand uh, but and that is the way in which city generates revenue and then that revenue is then used for infrastructure in the city or whatever it is right so it is a you know uh, Ebenezer Howard's proposal actually is a kind of a single land rent proposal. Hmm? It's not a, uh, a proposal where land is owned as a commodity by private owner. Okay, so that is an important dimension that is always missed out when one talks about Howard, because in order for there to be a possibility of a garden city, that should happen. Now, if you look at the way in which the garden city ideas and principles were applied in practice in various parts of the world. this was something that was almost never done okay there were many visual and physical elements of garden cities which were applied so you know there should be lots of garden lots of open spaces and there should be setbacks and there should not be overcrowding and those things were kind of implemented so even in bombay if you go to the other parsi colony you have you know very strict they, they, it was an outcome of very strict rules in terms of the amount of uh, built to unbuilt ratios and the uh, open spaces and setbacks and things like that but that was about it you know in fact the way in which the uh, garden city idea was implemented in bombay it was based on private property not based on a kind of collective uh, land ownership model hmm? so that's why the last uh, text says freedom and cooperation which is very important the kind of a cooperative land holding not a uh, uh individual private property based uh, land holding all right so anyway yeah um anybody wants to ask something um comment or respond to some of these things or we, or we can go on to the next step all right okay so who's reading this one can i yeah please go yeah um peter hall cities of tomorrow the city in the garden but though almost universally understood as merely a physical blueprint it was much more than that the final words under the third magnet freedom cooperation are not just rhetoric they are the heart of the plan as lewis mumford so rightly says in his 1946 introduction to the book howard was much less interested in physical forms than in social processes 
the key was that the citizens would own the land in perpetuity the land for each garden city and its surrounding green belt an area of 6000 acres 207 2700 hectares would be purchased in the open market at depressed agricultural land values 40 euros an acre that is 100 uh, euros per hectare and to for 2000 uh, 2 lakh 40000 euros in all and and in all the money raised on mortgage debentures paying 4% this land would be legally vested in four trustees soon howard argued the growth of garden city would raise land values and thus rents here was the innovative core of howard's proposal rents could and would be regularly revised upwards allowing the trustees to pay off the mortgage debt and then increasingly to generate a fund to provide a local welfare state all this was embodied in yet another color diagram in the first edition that was subsequently omitted with dire consequences to the understanding of howard's message and entitled the vanishing point of landlord's rent it illustrates how as urban land values built up in garden city these would flow back to the community it uh, in particular they would make it possible to fa- to found pensions with liberty for our aged poor fallen uh, sorry to found pensions with liberty for our aged poor now imprisoned in workhouses to banish despair and awaken hope in the breasts of those that have fallen to silence the harsh voice of anger and awaken the soft notes of brother brotherliness and goodwill howard could thus argue that this was a third socio economic system superior both to victorian capitalism and bureaucratic centralized socialism its keynote would be local management and self government services would be provided by the municipality or by private contractors as proved more efficient others would come from the people themselves in a series of what howard called a pro municipal experiments in particular people would build their own homes with capital provided through uh, building societies friendly societies cooperative societies or trade unions and this activity would in turn drive the economy for 40 years before john maynard um keynes or um franklin delano or uh, roosevelt howard had der- uh, arrived at the solution that society could spend its way out of a recession it would do so however without large scale central state intervention howard's plan was to realize uh, was to be realized through thousands of small scale enterprises every man and a woman a craftsman every man and a woman a craftsman and entrepreneur it co- it would call uh, he said for the for the very highest talents of engineers of all kinds of architects artists medical men experts in sanitation landscape gardeners agricultural experts surveyors builders manufacturers merchants and financiers organizers of trades tra- uh, trade unions friendly and cooperative societies as well as the very simplest forms of unskilled labor together with all the all those forms of lesser skill and talent which lie between it is peculiarly um, american vision the homesteading uh, spirit brought back to the industrial uh, england but it is homesteading uh, harnessed to new new technology to create a new socio economic order a remarkable vision not least for its startling modernity uh, even a century later for howard communal ownership of land was the essential foundation of his garden city but the collective ownership of land was in howard's view as far as things needed to go other forms of capital would be privately cooperatively or municipally owned yeah. okay so this pretty much says what i had uh, explained um okay um, after reading this th- does anybody have any questions or uh, thoughts uh i didn't get the land ownership thing uh, he was talking uh, in the in the first paragraph uh, this one about the How 60 this works? Or, yeah yeah no no forget the numbers okay forget the numbers uh, this is uh, yeah. he's basically trying to um in this book at least he's trying to 
right for a british audience so the values are in pounds and all that but basically the idea is that you can if you let's say you know you buy agricultural land agricultural land generally is lower value you know uh, and you and i all know that if you want to invest in land you generally buy an agricultural plot the land use changes it becomes non agricultural value goes up right so that's because uh, the uh, regulations that govern an agricultural plot are more strict you can't do certain kinds of building on it and so on right so when they when you change the permissions the land value goes up and so on. so what he's saying is that this garden city model could be implemented or applied immediately this is the reason why it's not your token you know you can do it today what you can do is you can buy a large plot of agricultural land somewhere okay buy it in bulk hmm? uh, there will be a certain amount of cost involved that cost can be borrowed from let's say a bank or from the government or something right uh, and uh, you will obviously pay that, pay back that money with a small interest hmm? so uh, how will you do that that um, the source of revenue to pay back that mortgage would be Uh, land rent, hmm. and there will be trustees and all of that. So he's kind of trying to talk about the governance model, you know. Uh, so you know how um, lands which are held by a trust are work, na? The trustees are not private property owners as such. What they are do, they are entrusted with that land. Uh, so the idea is that land is owned by everybody, but there are trustees who will probably you know be the board or whatever. Hmm? Uh, but the idea is that. the rents would be collected from everybody who uses land by the land owner which is the city as a whole collectively hmm? not by individual land owners and this is a very important point uh, because you know um, uh, 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 let's say what happens let's say if um, you build a metro line you have a plot on a next to a road today and you build a metro line there hmm? the when you when you build a metro line the land value of your plot without you doing anything to it the metro line is not on your plot it's next to your plot but your land value will go up why because um, because of that infrastructure project the, uh, um, the 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 land parcel becomes more accessible to many more people okay so the land value goes up now the thing is that without doing anything your land value went up so you are simply going to benefit from higher land values without actually producing anything on it you can probably it could be an empty plot and you're sitting on it forever you know um and uh, you know for instance you find lots of uh, vacant plots lying around uh, in bandra and juhu and places like that those plots are lying vacant forever you know N- nobody has built anything on it but the land values are very high because of what is around it right so what howard is doing is he's saying that all right you know uh, if you have one single owner of this all of the land all the rents that are collected then can be used as a corpus or a fund uh, as or re- as revenue for welfare projects so you don't need to worry about the state whether the state has nationalized land or whatever you don't need to worry about um uh, what the central government is doing or the state government is doing this is the city's own e- economy and it has generated revenue through um imposing a single rent across the board okay um and and that rent then can become the uh, the the fund for implementing social security healthcare education and so on you know i mean just think about it do a simple back of the envelope calculation for bombay uh, take all of the land of the city and say that there was a single rent you know how much would be the municipal corporation's uh, revenue per year it would be much 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 higher than what it is today through property tax and octroi and all of those things right so but that, and that money could then be used to fund all kinds of uh, welfare uh, state projects hmm? so what he is doing is he's distancing his proposal from the socialist model and from the capitalist model and he's creating a cooperative kind of uh, socialism which is being proposed here you know in the garden city id samajh aap Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I just add uh, something to what uh, Sanjay said. 
So uh, actually, the Garden City model is uh, emerged as a critique uh, of the industrial city, right? Because uh, the working classes uh, who work in industries were living in these dense settlements, you know, in crowded cities. So London was, uh, in fact, almost as the conditions of the working class in London at that time were almost as bad as in Bombay. And uh, that was the context in which Ebenezer Howard was uh, proposing this Garden City model. Uh, the idea was to have, uh, rather than centralized industries and large cities and these sprawling metropolises with you know uh, terrible living conditions for the working classes, uh, he spoke about decentralized industries. So there were industries interspersed with agriculture and primary activities and there were small scale cooperatives or you know communities so the sizes of cities also he, that he envisioned was much smaller so uh when so by while proposing this although i think one important aspect that gets missed out is his economic model and this model of you know collective ownership of land because now if you see what happened in many of the projects that got implemented uh, as Garden City projects, um, they became suburban developments, you know. So um, Howard uh, essentially was interested in making sure that it becomes affordable to live in the Garden City. He was looking at the working classes, the middle classes, the lower middle classes to be able to afford housing in the in these cities and to also have uh, employment and a good quality of life much better than they found uh, in you know large metropolitan industrial cities so um what happened uh, as an out uh, so, so which is why i think it was critical to have collective and not individual ownership and it was critical to also ensure that there was no speculation on land or you know it land was not commodified uh, what ended up happening was many garden cities were constructed and but because this uh, this idea of uh, you know Howard's which I mean the social and economic model because that wasn't really implemented uh, they became almost like these suburban schemes and it was usually the uh, elite or the upper middle classes who could then afford to invest in these uh, garden city houses as second homes and you know enjoy them for aesthetic uh, kind of uh, recreation or leisure and did not really become about a kind of creating a better kind of a solution for the working classes so that that is why how the garden city model failed even uh, in bombay when you see the garden city model as was applied to construct the colonial uh, suburbs, uh, industrial suburbs, uh, that was the Dadar Parsi and the Hindu colony, we realized that it was uh, largely the middle class or, you know, the Parsi or, or, you know, elite communities who could afford to live in that housing. You know? And uh, the working classes continue to live in uh, deprived and precarious conditions. Yeah, yeah. No, and uh, uh, an important point that uh, Shweta brought up which was the um, was the combination of uh, industry and agriculture within uh, the urban uh, realm. So it's not, um, you know, this kind of a Kobozian separation of function. It is an integration of function. So you do, um, you know, you you have small manufacturing units within your neighborhood. You also have fields within your neighborhood, you know. So this kind of combination of brain work and manual work is all a part of the urban city fabric. It's not something that you work in the city. You know, you work in the factory in the city, and then you go into a suburb to live uh, in the midst of nature. That kind of uh, what garden cities became, largely, especially in the American context. And if Shravan was here, he would have probably spoken about it for half an hour. Uh, was the uh, suburbanization of the city where uh, people would live away from the city and then come to the central city to work. Yeah, so that uh, that was something that was obviously, I mean, um, in, in name, it was inspired by the garden city idea, but it has nothing to do with 
Harvard's uh, central uh, core propositions about how a garden city is. Okay, Chalo, let's move to the next one. Who's reading this one? Anyone? Deep, I can see on my screen. Deep, read. Yeah, just a minute. I'll put my earphones on. Uh, Peter Hall, Cities of Tomorrow, City in the Region 2002. For this great work, Jets constantly argued the planner's ordinary maps were useless. You must ideally start with a great globe with uh, recluse proposed, but which was never built. Failing that, you must draw cross sections of that general slope from mountains to sea, which we find everywhere in the world, which we can really, which, which can, we can readily adapt to any scale and, and to any proportions of a particular and characteristic range of hills and slopes and plains. Only such a valley section, as we commonly call it, makes vivid to us the range of climate with its corresponding vegetation and animal life. The essential sectional outline of a geographer's region ready to be studied, examined closely, it finds place for all the nature occupations. Hunter, hunter and shepherd, poor, uh, peasant and rich, these are, for, these are most familiar occupational types and manifestly successive as we descend in altitude and also come down the course of social history. The reason, he thought, was the technological imperative. New sources of power, hydraulic and especially electric, meant that a big central unit of power was no longer needed. Industries that depended uh, chiefly uh, on skilled labor had no economics of scale. Observably, the new uh, the new industries tended to be uh, tended to be small in scale. Thus, big industrial concentrations represented uh, pure uh, pure historical inertia. There is absolutely no reason why why this uh, why these and like anomalies should persist. The industries must be scattered all over the world, and the scattering of industries amidst amidst the uh, civilized nations will be necessarily followed by a further scattering of factories over the territories of each nation. And this scattering of industries over the country, so as to bring the factory amidst the fields to make agricultural agriculture derive all these all those profits which it always finds in being combined with industry, and to produce a combination of industrial and agricultural work is surely the next step. This step is imposed by, uh, by the very necessity of producing of the producer themselves. It is imposed by the necessity for each healthy man and woman to spend a part of their lives in manual work in the free air. This was one of the most crucial insights that Jets borrowed from Koropkin. Already in 1899, presumably just uh, after reading the first edition of Fields, Factories and Workshop, he had uh, christened the new age of industrial decentralization the neotechnic era 38 the following uh, 38 the following year in a display at the great paris exposition he was he was using the terms pal paleotechnic and neotechnic the problem was that these spreading cities were still the outcome of the bad old uh, paleotechnic order which he saw as dis uh, dissipating resources and energy energies at depressing life under the rule of machine and uh, mammon and as working out accordingly its specific results in, an, in unemployment and misemployment, in disease and folly, in vice and apathy, in adolescence, in adolescence and crime, 54 the first step since the children, the women, the workers of the town can come but rarely to the country, was that we must therefore bring the country to them, make the field gain on the street, not mere, not merely the street gain on the field, 55. Uh, Towns must now cease to spread like expanding ink strains and grease spots, but it must go um, botanically. With green leaves set in alternation with its uh, golden rays, 56, the people of the city would uh, thus grow up amidst the sights and smells of the country. His ideas found an echo in Germany. Robert Schim, uh, sorry, 1869-1934, a counselor in the city of Essen between 1907 and 1920, then moved to head a new uh, regional organization. Uh, the Seldungs were banned. Uh, okay, I'll just skip that word. Uh, SVR, Ruhr Planning Association. Today, Communal were banned, Ruhr 
or inter municipal association of the rural district already in 1913 he had formulated a comprehensive open space policy and also a strategy to optimize the traffic in infrastructure 57 in this uh, he was clearly influ influenced by that of charles eliot for the city of boston with uh, urban areas penetrated by contiguous system of parks and playgrounds immediately connected with large forest areas and other open spaces outside the city as werner uh, hegeman uh, writes in a book uh, com commemorating a uh, 1910 town planning exhibition in dusseldorf dusseldorf 58 in a dank shrift think piece of 1912 he proposed that the city should be encircled uh, by green ring and traversed by radial wedges of green this would be a differentiated network of traffic routes serving long distance and short distance traffic both the passengers are goods both the passengers and goods this was the origin of the regional green open space by the svr soon after its foundation in 1920 59 all of these ideas of jedis were no more uh, than howard had said in one sense but jedis was uh, But Jedis was saying it uh, at the level of the entire city region, and that constituted uh, constituted its uh, unique novelty. Regional survey and their uh, applications, rural development, town planning, city design. He concluded. Good. This is this is the end. Yeah. Oh, the end. Okay, okay. So just uh, ignore the last line. I think that was some mistake while copying. Okay. Um. So leave this section on. Leave this section on. Okay. So uh, this is the uh, what? Uh, okay. So the link between Patrick Geddes and uh, uh, Ebenezer Howard essentially is that actually Ebenezer Howard was inspired by Patrick Geddes. um who kind of uh, belong to the uh, similar uh, circles and um uh, there were two two or three sources of influence of uh, Ebenezer Howard's ideas and especially the the more social and economic uh, side of his thinking was inspired by Patrick Geddes um Peter Kropotkin and Ellis Reclus uh, I think the text mentions Ellis Reclus uh, doesn't mention Kropotkin in fact it was uh, Peter Kropotkin who was the one who uh, spoke about um integrating uh, industry and agriculture in the same uh, in 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 the locality rather than separating them uh, you know functionally in the city uh, anyway so um, this valley section is a very important diagram that comes from patrick geddes as well now geddes is uh, 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 an influential figure in the urban planning movement mainly because of one idea which has kind of survived to this day and that is the concept called survey before plan you know so large part of uh, even even what bureau bureaucracies do these days in planning is first they make a land use survey okay except that patrick geddes never just said land use survey you know for patrick geddes it was a social survey he surveyed every aspect of life you know of uh, urban life uh, social life and that would then inform the planning process of course when bureaucracy takes something up uh, they reduce it into um, into uh, bring in all these simplifications which uh, changes the way in which things uh, are understood but that apart but patrick geddes's work is extremely rich in various uh, dimensions one of them was this what he called the valley section which is a uh, which is a kind of a um, uh, rendering of the way in which uh, occupations are related to um, to the uh, the kind of land on which you live you know um, in, including the topography the uh, proximity to certain things the um, uh, climatic conditions and so on so he, you know so if you are near the coast you will typically find people who are doing fish work you know then a little away from the coast you find the gardener and then the peasant and then the shepherd and you know on the hill slopes and then the hunter in the forest and the woodman in and and the upper forest and so on you know so there was a certain kind of understanding of the connection between human uh, social activity you know uh, and um, uh, or livelihood and the the land to which people belong you know uh, and in a way it's an inversion of the idea that 
land belongs to people. He said, actually, people belong to land. So the hunter belongs to the forest. The forest does not belong to the hunter, right? So that is a, 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 a the, the, the livelihood of the hunter is dependent on the existence of the forest. So in each of these occupations, you will see that there is a certain kind of um, mutuality when it comes to the um, the work that is being done and the e ecological resource that is being worked upon and it, its own persistence and, uh, uh, and its continuation is a very much a part of the job of the people who are practicing these occupations. Okay? So uh, what uh, when we talk about the region today, obviously, we talk about the Mumbai metropolitan region which is an administrative area. You know, it has a boundary, it has an area, it has a, uh, you know, so you go to the MMRDA and you will find the regional uh, plan uh, or the region boundary and so on. But uh, in Patrick Geddes' vision, the region was not a uh, bounded entity. You know, the region was, a, um, a, was something that um, connected, you know, was very much integral to the city. Uh, you know, because city dependent on the region and the region on the city, but it was not an administrative idea. It was an ecological idea. Okay, so this is the essentially. And Patrick Geddes, remember, was a biologist uh, uh, and uh, and a naturalist as well. So um, his ideas are. I mean, today in the with the kind of environmental consciousness and all of that, uh, Patrick Geddes is a very essential reading. This was more than a hundred years ago. He's talking about these ideas, which today a lot of people who claim to be ecologists talk about as though they, they've just invented all of this, you know. Um, uh, but Geddes was a pioneer in this uh, in this uh, aspect of uh, um, thinking about uh, city regions, you know, as a relationship of uh, human beings with their natural environment, you know. Uh, so, yeah, basically this is... Uh, uh, and, um, and the connection with uh, Howard comes in or Garden Cities comes in here because uh, it was Geddes who actually um, was uh, was an, played an influential role in the development of Ebenezer Howard's idea. Yeah. Okay. That's all I have to say. Anybody wants to comment or ask something? No? Uh, I had a silly doubt. Um, then no like, doubt, silly, my dear. Huh? Both. Like why? Oh, then why they were called like garden cities? But like there, there, there isn't a mention of like trees and all. Then like why it was like garden cities? Uh, <laughs> it's a very good question. It's not silly at all, actually. Um, so okay, what is a garden? I think Shweta is the best person to talk about. This. The garden, please talk about the garden. Yeah, so actually, um, like when you look at the term garden, in you know, I mean, the sense that it is commonly used, especially among um, architects and landscape designers, which is uh, essentially uh, it is the product of you know, landscape. Right, it's it, it's kind of a it's it's taming nature in order to kind of uh, you know manicure it and create a kind of an uh, aesthetic you know aesthetically appealing or a kind of an image of nature that is kind of it imitates nature but is not really natural in that sense. Uh, the idea of the the term garden also uh, implies the term enclosure, right? It is it is a a space which is enclosed is a space which is uh, as opposed to uh, nature which can be uh, wild dangerous or you know kind of uh, natural unpredictable a garden is also this idea of ordering or taming nature you know so that it becomes uh, uh, habitable or you know it can kind of then be used by people for recreation leisure contemplation etc so uh, even the discipline of uh, landscape design kind of emerged during the Romantic period in Europe. So clearly, uh, when uh, Ebenezer Howard was using the term uh, garden city, 
uh, he did not really uh, talk about these physical aspects of uh, garden or you know what constitutes garden and i, I think uh, these aesthetic concerns were kind of you know the last thing on his mind uh, what what he was looking at i i think i think it all began with the critique of the large uh, kind of uh, you know industrial metropolitan uh, cities which were you know which had filthy dense uh, working class uh, conditions and they also had a very polluted environment and uh, he was looking at a uh, kind of uh, taking the values of the countryside and the city and kind of uh, talking about a more uh, you know a, a kind of a decentralized development of towns where uh, people could enjoy you know people could also have economic opportunities but would not be subjected to living in the dense metropolitan conditions so he was looking at an alternative model which would give better living conditions to people and also ensure that they could uh, enjoy the benefits of living in the countryside you know without uh, while enjoying the benefits of urban life you know so i think that that is what he kind of imagining so i think in that sense he is uh, talking about uh, you know he, he used the term garden city but he, clearly he does not mean uh, the the garden in that sense um i think even kobuzia used a similar kind of a term like because his his idea was to have towers in the park right where again it's it, like um a, a pretty because uh, i think uh, he he kind of looked at the uh, these um, you know uh, high rise buildings and you know uh, a city of towers and uh, in in uh, uh, like a, like critiquing the kind of dense uh, historic medieval city he was proposing an alternative where you would have you know uh, this functional segregation of museums and you know isolated buildings which were set in large parks you know and and that that was his so i think um, yeah clearly but i i uh, yeah i think the question is interesting but i think husain maybe you can shed more light on that in terms of why he used the term garden um i don't know why you use the term garden but from what uh, uh, shudha is saying also it, it it actually can be an interesting way of um, um you know developing a um a, a, a reading of ebenezer howard's concept of the garden he doesn't i don't think he talks too much about it um but it's uh, i think it's definitely a weak point in the, in 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 his work because uh, a large part of the um disfiguration of the garden city idea is also a result of the uncritical or a critical use of the term garden you know if you say garden uh, and if you by garden if you mean a tamed kind of an environment then uh, the you know uh, the urban park is very much that kind of a garden uh, but when you're saying you live in the midst of uh, nature which is what uh, uh, ebenezer howard is talking about it is it need not necessarily be the garden of that kind you know it is the um uh, so uh, so i think this is a weakness in uh, howard's work uh, and actually your question is uh, really is um, hits the um, it hits a very important uh, uh, flaw in the work really uh, which has led to a lot of um, misunderstandings of the ebenezer howard in vision of the garden city but if you if you link harvard with his um with with people like eddies then you realize that maybe that is not what he was talking about it's not the tamed garden but it was uh, more like the the field you know or, or it was more like the uh, the, the the coast or the more like the forest you know uh, which is where people occupation would be very close to um to the to the way in which uh, the the land was you know it's not a um, it, it's not necessarily the distinction between uh, wild and domestic but it is the distinction between aesthetic and uh, functional and i think howard had a fairly functional view of the garden not an aesthetic view of the garden i think the idea of town country or the town country magnet i think that is more kind of you know uh, appropriate to describe the model he was talking about and which is kind of also similar because he was 
influenced by Geddes. So it's also uh, similar to the last essay where we are, we are looking at, you know, where Geddes is talking about the city in the region and, you know, the idea of having green bells or these radiating corridors of green and, you know, again, a kind of a de decentralized uh, a kind of development of a region uh, such that the occupations of the countryside and various kinds of primary uh, you know activities which uh, are represented in the valley section those are retained while kind of you know developing uh, smaller decentralized towns as opposed to the metropolitan sprawl which kind of takes over everything and you know it kind of destroys not just uh, nature and the countryside, uh, but also these uh, people and their occupations who kind of depend on the countryside. So I think uh, there is a kind of a similarity in both the models, you know, uh, uh, parallels between what Howard and Geddes are in fact talking about. And I agree that the idea, the, I think the term garden city has become counterproductive because then what 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 has happened is people have, like, like they interpreted his concentric circle diagram with, you know, uh, these radial circles and towns, literally, some people have literally kind of focused on the form of, you know, Howard's diagram without understanding that the diagram actually was just a representation of, you know, a, a social and economic model for uh, alternative uh, urban future. Um, I think uh, similarly, the term garden has also been taken literally because uh, then if, you know, Bangalore is talked about as a garden city because it has many gardens. Chandigarh is described as a garden city because there are, you know, uh, lots of uh, gardens and green bears in Chandigarh. Uh, even uh, the, the suburbs, the other Parsi colony, etc., said to be based on the garden city. And there's nothing um, that really links these places to. Howard's ideas, except that they have lots of open spaces and parks and green spaces. Yeah, so it's kind of a, a literal kind of a meaning that is uh, taken. Hi, okay, so thanks. Uh, um, yeah, I am, if there are any more comments or suggestions or we can or questions or we can end. Next week we'll do either radiant cities or city in the region, one of the two, um, but which will basically build on this. So if there are any questions that develop over the week, please make a note of them. We can always discuss it in class next week. All right. Okay. Then see you guys next week and uh, take care. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.